And just like that, the fake political emergency is over. Dustin Trudeau says the country is now safe, but will he ever recover? I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. So I guess we can all breathe a sigh of relief because on Wednesday afternoon, Justin Trudeau came out and lo and behold, he said that there is no longer an emergency. This political emergency is over. So they have withdrawn and revoked the Emergency Act after voting on it just two days earlier, not even two full days, about 36 or 40 hours after it was voted on and passed in the House of Commons, it is now revoked. So Justin Trudeau came out Wednesday afternoon at 4.15 and said that after careful consideration, we are able to confirm that the situation is no longer an emergency. Therefore, the federal government will be ending the use of the Emergency Act. Here is what that looked like. And today, after careful consideration, we're ready to confirm that the situation is no longer an emergency. Therefore, the federal government will be ending the use of the Emergencies Act. Well, isn't that just incredible? So so you might be asking yourself, what exactly changed between Monday evening when the House of Commons voted? Re- recall that the entire Liberal caucus, the entire NDP caucus voted in favor of this. The Liberal government whipped their MPs. It was a confidence vote, meaning if they didn't get the votes that they needed, we would get triggered into an election. So it was so important that they all voted in favor of this act that there was some kind of pressing emergency, some kind of threat to our sovereignty, to our supply chains, our economy, the border integrity. The entire country was at risk on Monday evening. We needed to pass this Emergencies Act, even though the protests had already been cleared, even though the police had already marched through Ottawa and removed all the trucks, all the protesters, no borders were currently blocked. Uh, Nothing was going on on Monday night that warranted this. Somehow, less than two days later, with no change, no new intel, no police actions, nothing changed. And the Emergency Act is lifted. Of course, all of this just goes to suggest that there was no emergency in the first place. This was all political. It was entirely politically motivated. Justin Trudeau found himself in a bad situation that he himself created. He ignored a working class uprising. By the time they showed up in Ottawa, he called them every name in the book, refused to engage, refused to meet with them, it made the situation worse, angered his own base for neglecting to deal with the situation. It made him look incredibly weak, incredibly standoffish. No one even knows where he went. He went and disappeared to an uh, undisclosed location. No one knew where he was. He showed no leadership whatsoever. Remember that poll that was done by David Coletto over at Abacus? They found that of all the levels of government, both sides blamed Justin Trudeau the most when it came to the people who support the convoy, it, all the various people to blame, whether it was the police, the local Ottawa City Council, the mayor, uh, the Ottawa, uh, the Ontario government, or the feds. Most people blame the feds. On the other side, people who oppose the convoy, same exact breakdown. Most people blamed Trudeau. So Trudeau was to blame on both sides. He thought that using this emergency act to just finally clear out the protest would be good enough. Of course, by the time they voted on it, the protest was already cleared. None of this made any sense. Regardless, the emergency act is now gone. So I guess the emergency is over. We can all breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, wait a minute. The government also announced that they are going to continue with the completely egregious practice of stealing people's bank accounts, freezing their bank accounts, making them unbanked, basically removing them from the modern economy. So Chrystia Freeland speaking on Wednesday, she said this about bank accounts. She said, concerning bank accounts, the process of unfreezing these bank accounts has already begun, as the RCMP notes. I'd just like to stress that there are bank accounts that will remain frozen, not because of the emergency orders. There will be other orders, court orders and others. And because of these orders, the bank accounts may still be frozen. So even though they've removed this draconian piece of legislation that allowed them to do all kinds of abuses and and have all kinds of unprecedented power, the ability to freeze people's money, the probably the most terrifying aspect of this entire ordeal, uh, they're just going to hold on to that for a little while longer. Well, the Trudeau government admitted that a $20 donation, a donation as little as $20 to the Freedom Convoy may be enough to freeze your bank account. This is True North's Cosme Gerza reporting. He writes this, banks across Canada have frozen Canadians' accounts to the tune of nearly $8 million after the Trudeau government ordered a crackdown on the Freedom Convoy's financial support. According to Blacklock's reporter, a Department of Finance said during a Commons Finance Committee meeting that even a $20 donation could lead to consequences. This is a quote from the Assistant Deputy Finance Minister. She said, it would be unlikely that someone who gave $20 three weeks ago 
or even $20 post February 15th would be captured by a freeze, but it's not impossible. So they're going to try their best not to freeze your bank account if you donated to the Freedom Convoy, but it's not impossible. In other words, it's possible. What a mess. What a total sloppy mess. This is a Globe and Mail reporting. They say that government officials said earlier this week that about 206 bank accounts holding a total of $7.8 million were frozen using the emergency measures, most of which were identified as having ties to organizers of the protest or owners of vehicles used to block roads. Key word there, having ties to the protest and the owners of the vehicles. So, so not even necessarily the individuals who were at the protest or the individuals who owned trucks that were at the protest, just people who had ties to them. That sort of vague language should really send a chill down your spine. They've taken 206 bank accounts. I should note that is more bank accounts than the U.S. federal government seized after 9-11. After 9-11, when they were trying to crack down on the terrorists that funded the hijacking of airplanes that flew into buildings and killed nearly 3,000 people, including Canadians, they seized fewer than 150 bank accounts. When a group of truckers roll into Canada, Canada seizes more bank accounts than the U.S. government after 9-11. Absolutely unbelievable. I'll continue to read from this Globe and Mail report. It says, Canada's banks have since unfrozen most accounts belonging to customers who were linked to illegal blockades, according to the Canadian Bankers Association. Dozens of people tied to the protest had access to financial services cut off last week under emergency powers and acted to pressure protesters to leave downtown Ottawa. Gotta love how the legacy media just slips in the government talking points here. They were linked to illegal blockades. Okay, I'll just note, yes, there were some illegal blockades that happened during the protests. The blocking of the Ambassador Bridge, that was an illegal blockade. There were other blockades at international border crossings, at Canada-US border crossings, that were indeed illegal. But calling the Ottawa protest an illegal blockade is government propaganda. That is not what happened. It was a protest similar to every other protest that we see in Ottawa, a whole bunch of people going up on the lawn in front of Parliament, blocking up Wellington Street, people parking their cars there, people walking on the street. That is not illegal in Canada. That is not an illegal blockade. That is a legal, peaceful protest. And every time the legacy media comes out and says that it was an illegal blockade and they describe the Ottawa protests that way, the more that people don't trust legacy media because that is propaganda. They are shilling for Trudeau. They're using his language to try to confuse you, to try to make you on the side of Trudeau and to tell you that there was something nefarious, something illegal about what the peaceful truckers were doing. That is wrong. And I'm going to call it out every single time because it is maddening to see the use of propaganda in the legacy media promoting Justin Trudeau and promoting his language he used to justify this whole thing. We know this whole thing had no justification. We know that now because he revoked it 36 hours after he implemented it, even though nothing changed in those 36 hours. So after this thing was passed in the House of Commons on Monday night, it went to the Senate. The Senate was right in the middle of debating it when Justin Trudeau came out and revoked it, making the Senate debate sort of a moot point. However, I want to cover a little bit of what happened in the Senate because there were some very good, very articulate points raised by conservative senators who articulated it perfectly better than I can. So I'm going to play you this clip from Senator Don Platt. He is the leader of the opposition in the Senate, explaining perfectly well why Justin Trudeau was completely wrong to enact this emergency act. Here's that clip. We're now being asked to vote on a government motion. I agree with most of the legal and constitutional experts, most of the provinces, and most of the observers in Canada and in the rest of the world. This government, the Trudeau government, failed to make its case for the use of the Emergencies Act. Furthermore, the measures it adopted are not reasonable, not proportionate, and not necessary. And finally, even if the declaration of emergency was warranted and the measure satisfied the criteria I just mentioned, the emergency no longer exists. This is why, together with other reasons, I will explain why I will be voting against Senator Gold's motion. Not reasonable, not proportionate, and not necessary. That is absolutely correct, and that is exactly right. Justin Trudeau should have never used this act in the first place. Denise Batters, who is now also with the Conservatives, recall that Erin O'Toole kicked her out of the Conservative Caucus. Well, now that Erin O'Toole is gone, she is back with the Conservative Caucus, and she also made a very, very passionate speech reminding everybody that they were sitting in the chamber, in the Senate chamber, the exact place where the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was negotiated. That shouldn't be lost on anybody. Here is Denise Batters making an excellent point in the Senate. It has not been lost on me, nor should it be on any of you, 
that this building, now the Senate of Canada building, where I deliver this speech today, is the very building where our Charter of Rights and Freedoms was negotiated. Think of that history, honourable senators, when you consider whether to allow this federal government to trample all over that charter. People on both sides of the political spectrum have expressed the view that the Trudeau government's invocation of the Emergencies Act in this situation is considerable government overreach. We need to assert ourselves, honourable senators, and reject this unprecedented authoritarian overreach by this federal government. Reject this unprecedented authoritarian overreach by the federal government. Well, lucky for the Trudeau government, he has the unwavering support of the legacy media. So the legacy media were quick to jump in and let everyone know nothing to see here. Everything was handled perfectly well. There was no abuse of power whatsoever. This is all over now. Let's just sweep it under the rug and move on with our lives. So here is Andrew Coyne doing his best to try to justify what Justin Trudeau did, saying that basically everything was exactly right. So here is his timeline. Very distorted and I will explain why. So so Andrew Coyne says this, January 28th to February 14th, Ottawa paralyzed, police do nothing. February 14th, federal emergency declaration. February 18th to 20th, police move in, blockades clear. February 23rd, emergency declaration lifted. In some, emergency declaration restores order, is lifted soon after, and then he mocks his critics saying, outrage. Basically, Andrew Coyne just thinks that Justin Trudeau is hunky-dory. He handled this all perfectly well. Nothing to see here. Nothing was wrong. Well, there are a few problems with Andrew Coyne's timeline. I created my own timeline because Andrew Coyne just didn't get the facts right here. Okay, so yes, a convoy rolled into town on January 28th. It, it started a week earlier when they decided that they were going to do their slow roll from Vancouver all the way. New convoys were created all over the country. Everyone started going to Ottawa, converging onto Ottawa to show their displeasure with the Trudeau government, with the mean-spirited, heavy-handed vaccine mandates at a time when the vaccine mandates are, have been proven to be not effective at all. Look, everybody who's had Omicron has recovered. They're ready to move on with their lives. The vaccine mandate is unnecessary at this point. Okay, so, so, so the protest moves into town. It was a noisy protest, correct, but it was also a peaceful protest and a legal protest. So saying that Ottawa was paralyzed is completely hyperbolic and untrue. There was a small part of Ottawa that was disturbed by this. It was a noisy protest. The purpose of a protest is to be noisy, is to be disruptive, is to make people feel uncomfortable. In this case, make the elites who live in Ottawa, who make all the decisions, make them feel uncomfortable to know how uncomfortable they're making people feel with their heavy-handed orders. Okay, so, 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 so we agree that there was a protest in Ottawa January 28th. I would say it was a noisy protest and the police did their job. The job of the police is to keep the peace, to keep things calm. During that period of time, there was no violence. There were no major arrests. There's no property damage. It was a very calm, albeit noisy, albeit disruptive protest. So police do nothing isn't true. It's not the police's job to solve a political problem. It is not the police's job to make Trudeau's problems go away. Trudeau could have met with the truckers. Trudeau could have tried to hear the truckers. Trudeau could have made a good faith effort to try to negotiate in some way with the truckers to say, okay, I understand your point. Let's perhaps lift this mandate or let's make more exemptions for people who don't want to get vaccinated at this point. Instead, what did he do? He poured gasoline on the fire. He called them racist. He called them Nazis. He said that he wanted nothing to do with it. He demonized an entire class of working people in, in, a, in a very divisive way. Most Canadians see it that way. Okay. Andrew Coyne missed this point, which was that on February 13th, the day before the federal emergency was declared, the Ambassador Bridge was cleared. So, so yes, there was an illegal blockade. It happened on the Ambassador Bridge that connects Windsor to Detroit. That was cleared over the weekend. The Ambassador Bridge was cleared using the existing laws on the books. So the next day after the Ambassador Bridge had already been cleared, Justin Trudeau comes in and declares an emergency, even though there was no current blockades at that time. Regardless, the journalists cheered and, and cheered for their hero and said, hooray for Trudeau. Let's get rid of this mess. February 18th to 20th, uh, Coyne says that police moved in and blockades were cleared. I, I, I clarified that a little bit to show what really went on, which was that the police crushed a peaceful protest. Then on February 21st, after the protest was already gone, the Emergency Act was passed in the House of Commons. And two days later, even though nothing changed, the Emergency Act was lifted and journalists are just pretending that there is nothing to see there. Mark Gerritsen, a Liberal MP, likewise made the same point, basically, that the nothing nothing was done wrong, nothing to see here, let's all just move on with our lives, everything was handled properly. He writes this, the Emergency Act exactly served its purpose. It was one, targeted only where it was needed, two, proportionate to the threat, three, lasted only as long as needed, and four, always maintained charter rights. 
I mean, I mean, that whole, okay, well, that whole thing is wrong. Targeted only where needed. Where exactly was it needed? Because by the time it was enacted and, and passed, the protest was already gone, okay? Proportionate to the threat, they used undue force, excessive force against unarmed, peaceful protesters to clear them out because Trudeau simply didn't want them there. It was a political problem, not a threat, not a national security threat, regardless of how many times liberals repeat that. Lasted only as long as needed. Well, it wasn't needed at all. Always maintain the charter rights. I, I can't wait until the conservatives are in power and there is a big protest that rolls into town or there is a big foreign funded environmental movement or protest and all of a sudden the conservatives start considering using some of these same tactics against the left against liberals i wonder how they'll feel about their charter rights when if and when a conservative government ever seizes the bank accounts of political activists on the left i'm sure they will have a different tune well candace bergen who's the interim leader of the conservative party came out with a pretty strong statement she wrote this the conservative party knew it was wrong canadians knew he was wrong the pm was wrong when he invoked it he was wrong when he voted to continue it at 8 p.m on monday he was wrong when he made it a confidence vote nothing has changed between monday and today other than a flood of concerns from canadian citizens bad press and international ridicule it's a really good point because you wonder so what what did change what was the main thing that changed between monday night when they voted this thing in with a confidence vote and wednesday afternoon when they left it well what changed i'll tell you what changed polling, public opinion polls came out. And again, it did not look good for Justin Trudeau. So an Ipsos poll came out on Thursday, reflecting what had been happening in the week prior. And I'm sure PMO or Justin Trudeau's inner circle got their hands on this, or they had their own internal polling that was saying the exact same thing. But this global poll came out and it's pretty devastating for Justin Trudeau. It shows that Trudeau gets a failing grade from Canadians. So I'm just going to read this piece because it's really interesting, not just to see the facts of the poll, but also how global news and legacy media cover Justin Trudeau and cover this convoy. So here's global news. It says Trudeau's convoy response gets a failing grade, but even fewer support protesters poll. So they even have to put it in, even though Justin Trudeau is the leader of the country, it is his responsibility to keep peace, keep order and keep the country united. They, 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 they instead of just focusing on how he gets a failing grade, they had to add in, oh, but don't worry, he's still more popular than those working class truckers as if that helps, but they just had to throw that in there. Okay, so I'll read from the story. It says, as the so-called freedom convoy comes to an end in Ottawa, they even put freedom convoy in scare quotes there, it says Canadians remain divided on how they feel about the protests. According to a new Ipsos poll published Thursday, Canadians' approval of Justin Trudeau's handling of the convoy blockade was only seven points higher than that of the protesters. The poll conducted exclusively for Global News showed that 43% of Canadians approved of the way Trudeau handled the three-week-long protests, while 36% supported the truckers. So the way that they're even painting this and showing this is like kind of trying to pit Justin Trudeau versus the truckers and in our parliamentary system, 43% approval rating isn't that bad. What they bury a little further down is that a staggering 52% of people said that Justin Trudeau's rhetoric and the way that he approached the situation made things worse and that he was mostly responsible for what happened. So rather than putting that side by side, 43% approved, 53% that he was to fault, they bury the 53 later on and they pit him against a lower Pop, a, a lower support level for the truckers. It continues to go on. It says, in Ontario, where most of the protests actively was focused, 49% approved of Doug Ford's handling. So Ford had a higher approval rating than Trudeau, even though they essentially took the same position. The only difference was that Justin Trudeau was far more divisive in his language. And I want to read you this paragraph because it's, it really just shows you the mindset of the people who write the news and the people who conduct these polls. They're, they're, they're always on the side of the liberals. They're always cheering for the liberals. They're always cheering for Trudeau. And let me explain explain what I mean. This is a quote. It says, what's particularly worrying is that 52% of the people that we interviewed said that the prime minister's divisive rhetoric and the way that he approached the protest was mostly responsible for what happened. Daryl Bricker, CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs, told Trudeau. So, so wait a minute. What's particularly worrying is that 52% of Canadians oppose Trudeau. Why would that be particularly worrying for anyone other than Justin Trudeau himself and other than the PMO and Trudeau's inner circle? Why would the head of a polling company say that it's particularly worrying that Canadians oppose Trudeau? I mean, just, just the mindset of the way that they write the news and they put this stuff together is, is just really, really telling. So I'll continue reading. It says this. Bricker said that the issue here is that even though authorities may not like it, data is showing that protesters have gained a certain amount of sympathy 
apathy among the Canadian population. The poll also states a deep generational divide is evident with a majority of those 18 to 34, 58%, and 35 to 54, 53%, sympathizing with the protesters compared to only 32% of them aged over 55. That is really bad news for Justin Trudeau. The fact that 18 to 34-year-olds, nearly 60%, nearly two-thirds of people in that younger age group sympathize with the convoy. Not good news at all for Justin Trudeau. One other bit of news I want to cover here, which is I, I mentioned this on the show the other day that Tamara Litch, one of the organizers and the one that started the GoFundMe campaign, a uh, Métis woman, she was arrested during the police action over the weekend. And I mentioned that she was denied bail. What I didn't mention at the time because it wasn't out yet was that the person who was presiding over the case, the judge presiding over the case that denied Tamara Litch bail was a former liberal party candidate. She was one of, she ran for Justin Trudeau's liberal party in the 2011 election. She lost and then Trudeau appointed her to the federal bench. She is now the one overseeing this. This is, this is an insane conflict of interest. The fact that this judge hasn't re recused herself from this case is insane because the appearance of political interference, political bias of undermining again of our judicial system and the rule of law is really, 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 really bad. So this judge also made 71 donations to the Liberal Party between 2009 and 2014, ranging amounts from $5 to $1,186. And here is Justin Trudeau back in 2013, promoting her in a video saying that she is has vision and she's authentic. Here he is endorsing a judge who is now denying bail to one of these organizers. This is unbelievable. Here is what that looked like. It's an extraordinary pleasure for me to tell you how much I have uh, great admiration for Julie Bourgeois. Uh, her vision, her authenticity, uh, her strength. Uh, is going to be an amazing asset both to the people of Glengarry Prescott Russell but also to everyone in the House of Commons after the next elections when I ha will have hopefully the honor of uh, sitting beside her in the House. Thank you very much. So this judge, Judge Bourgeois, she now says, I cannot be assured that if I release you into the community, you will not reoffend. So she is held without the possibility of bail because it, because supposedly she's a threat to public safety. Well, wait a minute, the Emergency Act is over now. So the threat is over, according to Justin Trudeau. They no longer need the Emergency Act. And yet uh, a Métis woman who organized a GoFundMe campaign can't be released because she's a threat. This is wild. Again, this is Banana Republic kind of stuff. Keep in mind that the deranged left-wing activist, the Antifa activist who rammed his car into the protest, who hit four protesters with his car, that guy, yeah, that guy was released on bail. No problem. He's facing 11 serious charges. He assaulted people, injured people, tried to murder people. And all he had to do was post $10,000 bail. He's allowed out. No big deal. But when it comes to the organ for an event who committed no violence, who committed no assault, who has been peaceful throughout. Apparently, she is a threat to public and can't be released. Look, Justin Trudeau's abuses of power continue, even though the Emergency Act is over. He's declared it over. He's admitted that it was all a political facade. Well, his abuses of power continue, and Canadians are continuing to take note. Most have concluded that despite the media cheerleading, despite the spin and the propaganda being fed to you by the legacy media, that Justin Trudeau is the big loser of these blockades. He ignored the legitimate concerns of the working class. He demonized the truckers, he called them every name in the book, and he poured gasoline on the fire. Rather than being a leader and dealing with it, he then hid. He hid out in an undisclosed location for weeks, waiting for someone else to solve his problem. Well, when all else failed, he staged an unprecedented power grab to squash a peaceful protest. People saw, and people will remember that. No amount of media spin will make that go away. Trudeau gambled and he lost. I'm Candace Malcolm and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.